Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this set of podcasts, we look at trade unions and the rise of the Labour Party, conscription, charitable work and refugees, internees and prisoners of war. We hear now from Dr Peter Grant about charitable work during the First World War. I'm Dr Peter Grant. I work at the Cass Business School, which is part of City University in London. My particular interests in the First World War are around volunteering, charities, philanthropy and the cultural aspects. There are many historians that say that the late Victorian period was the greatest flowering of philanthropy ever in the United Kingdom. However, I think that the First World War itself was the greatest flowering of philanthropy. One of the aspects of the Victorian and Edwardian period was that people, particularly those in the working class that were seeking to better themselves, as it was called at the time, tended to join all sorts of organisations, whether they were cultural, artistic, part of a church or a trade union. So charity was in a pretty good state at that time, though the causes that charity and philanthropy raised money for were very different. In 1914, the biggest causes were overseas missions. It was never the same again for overseas missionary work. Charity started to concentrate more on activities within the country itself rather than overseas. In August 1914, Lots of people started volunteering, not just for the army, but also for charity and philanthropy as well. But they tended to be big national causes like the National Relief Fund, which initially raised funds, particularly because they thought there would be a lot of unemployment caused by the war. In the first few months, there actually were. And so money was collected, both from individuals and from organisations, to try to do something about that. The other big cause right at the start of the war was the influx of Belgian refugees. Although there were national organisations, a lot of small local ones started as well, particularly in the areas where the refugees came into the country, such as Folkestone, but also in London and other big cities. People started forming small committees and offering both accommodation and work for Belgian refugees. The other forms of philanthropy, particularly around support for the troops abroad, were very haphazard. There hadn't been a large number of organisations that were doing work like this before. If you were a well-established and, shall we say, more upper-class regiment, you were much more successful in getting donations than you were if you were newly formed Kitchener armies. Things were not exactly well organised. So by the time we get to 1915, there was quite a lot of criticism about what was going on, mainly in two areas. The first one was this inconsistency and haphazard nature of the collection of what were termed comforts for the troops. You can see that in quite a lot of contemporary and post-war writings, such as Robert Graves' Goodbye to All That. His regiment, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, quite an upper-class regiment, was doing rather too well. People would be sent too many pairs of socks or new shirts or balaclava helmets, whereas other regiments were actually suffering from deprivation. Things started getting into the press. Both the more popular press, such as the Mail, but particularly into the Times, which was being read by MPs and influential people. It was decided that something had to be done about this. So you had a bit of a clash between the Whitehall bureaucracy, particularly from General Sir John Cowens, who was the director of logistics in the UK, and General Maxwell, who was the director of logistics at HQ in France and Belgium. Cowens was picking up all sorts of letters to MPs and in the press, telling Maxwell that things were not going terribly well. Maxwell thought this was a terrible imposition and what was he doing talking about socks when he ought to be talking about fighting and said, no, 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 everything is fine. But a number of MPs asked questions in the House and things were getting quite difficult. At the same time, there was also quite a lot of coverage of scandals in charities themselves Because the Charity Commission at the time only covered charities that had an endowment, charities that just collected money and then spent it were not registered with the Charity Commission and therefore not controlled in any way. This was getting to be quite an issue. You had a number of 
very prominent cases, such as the Belgian Canal Boat Fund, subject of a very famous poster, and later on the French Relief Fund, which was one of the biggest charities of all, who were subject to inquiries for fraud. Though neither of them were direct frauds, what was happening was that the people that were running them were making a very nice living out of it and not distributing as much money as they could. So you've got two pressures here, one of them about fraud, one of them about comforts for the troops not being properly regulated. You had two responses to that, one from the state and one from the army and Whitehall. The pressure of fraud was eventually addressed by Parliament passing the War Charities Act in 1916, which regulated all wartime charities. They all had to register, they all had their books inspected, they all had to have a proper committee. This was a partially successful approach because it did depend on local authorities enforcing it. And it's clear from my research that in certain parts of the country they really did very little, whereas in London they did quite a lot. In fact, Harold Bird, who was the secretary of the London County Council, was extremely tenacious in looking at new wartime charities, though unfortunately he displayed something of a class bias when he did this. He was extremely scrupulous at looking into very small working-class charities, especially when they were run by people like East European Jews. He spent lots of money on private detectives looking into the lives and the bona fides of the people running these. There was one very small Jewish charity in the East End that he had something like 70 reports produced on and then refused them registration on the grounds that he didn't think they were properly run. On the very same day that he refused registration to this charity, he accepted, without a word, another charity run by a titled individual who turned out to be a complete con man. His title was perfectly legitimate, but all the money went into his own pocket. So it was only a partially successful solution, though it did quieten down the media attention. The response from the army came in 1915, In late September 1915, the Army Council appointed Sir Edward Ward as the Director General of Voluntary Organisations. Now, Ward's name is pretty much unknown today. One of the reasons for this is that he left no papers behind. His two sons died very young, and they too left no private papers. However, I think he's probably one of the forgotten heroes of the First World War and indeed the pre-war period. Ward had started off his life in the precursor of the Army Service Corps. His first major campaign was the Second Ashanti War, where he completely revolutionised logistics for that war by the very simple method of employing local, what we call native bearers, ensuring that the army officers that were in charge of them not only knew their language, but also knew their customs and culture and made sure that they were paid on time and in full. That was a fairly minor campaign. He came back to the UK. He was put in charge of the Royal Military Tournament, a very famous activity which is still there for raising money for military charities. Previously, the tournament had raised, if it was lucky, two or three hundred pounds a year. Sometimes it even lost money. Under Ward, it never made less than two thousand pounds in profit. After Ward left, it took another 20 years to get back to the same sorts of levels of income. Then he was sent to South Africa during the South African War and very quickly found himself in charge of supplies at Ladysmith, which came under siege. During the siege of Ladysmith, he made a few weeks' supply last for something like five months. There were no deaths through malnutrition at all, not of white or blacks, not of military or civilians. He also managed to produce a newspaper to keep up morale, which he called the Ladysmith Liar, L-Y-R-E. But I think probably there was a bit of fake news in that as well. When the Boers came to Parley, Ward managed to feed up the contingent of soldiers that were going out to meet them so that they looked extremely well fed and the Boers were rather surprised at this. After Ladysmith, he was put in charge of supplies for the whole of the South African War. He tried to do an awful lot for the welfare of horses. There was a terrible loss of horses during the war. Ward was always somebody who looked after the welfare both of humans and horses. When he came back to the UK, he was made the Under-Secretary of State at the War Office. 
but very quickly became the permanent secretary. And he was permanent secretary at the War Office for something like 13 years, up to 1914. To start with, he didn't get on particularly well with Arnold Foster, who was the Tory Minister of War. Ward wanted to do a lot of reforms which Arnold Foster was not in favour of. One of the reforms that Ward had suggested was the formation of the Officer Training Corps. And his blueprint for that had to go on to hold. But when the Liberal government came into power in the election in 1904, the 1905-06 period, Richard Burden Haldane became War Minister and he and Ward got on like a house on fire. Ward managed to implement a lot of the reforms that Haldane was planning and he was involved in a lot of the major reforms of the period for which he is given very little credit. Most histories again say that the OTC was a Haldane idea. It wasn't. Ward had already presented the full blueprint to Arnold Foster and brought it out again when Haldane came in. He worked on the plans for mobilisation with Sir Douglas Haig, which went so smoothly in 1914. And probably most importantly, he was the leading light at the War Office in forming the first army administration course at the London School of Economics, the first university course for army officers. Here he brought together people that you wouldn't expect to be exactly on the same side, such as Haig on one side and Beatrice and Sidney Webb on the other. So he had both socialists and staunch conservatives working together on this course. Something like 70 or 80 officers had gone through the course by the time of the First World War. Many of them went on to significant careers in logistics and the Army Service Corps during the war itself. So Ward was a very significant figure in Whitehall. He had the confidence of the politicians. He had the confidence of the army. He retired just before war broke out and had intended to have a slightly more easy time of it, although he was, for example, also chairman of the RSPCA. He was a very active chairman. He went to court on a number of occasions to personally prosecute people who had been cruel to animals. He also established the Union Jack Club, which is still there just behind Waterloo Station, for other ranks because they didn't have somewhere that they could go like the Army and Navy Club for officers. And he'd also done a number of other things at the War Office, such as established sports organisations where every rank could work together. Ward was well known in army and administrative circles. He'd also had a lot of contact before the war with the London Council for Voluntary Service. He knew voluntary action and activities quite well. Ward was the right person for the job of Director General of Voluntary Organisations. He didn't stifle voluntarism by trying to be overbearing. He was as light touch as he could, whilst at the same time ensuring that activities were coordinated in such a way that you didn't have these mismatches of supply that had caused the sock scandal, as I call it, in the earlier part of 1915 the one that had appeared in the press and was saying that some regiments had just been getting an oversupply of comforts and others had been getting nothing at all. A couple of examples show how successful Ward was. First of all, there was nothing in the press ever again about a mismatch of supply. I can't find a single story after September 1915 when Ward was appointed. Secondly, the government tried to do something very similar with supplies for prisoners of war. And things went horribly wrong. One of the things that happened with prisoners of war was that the person in charge said officers' families could send them as many parcels as they like. Other ranks could only be sent one parcel a month. Absolutely disastrous. Undermined both officer and men's morale. Ward never did anything like that. He was very light touch with the organisations that existed. He was also quite tough with the bigger organisations if they didn't want to play ball. For example, with the Red Cross, he wrote a couple of very stiff letters when they said, oh no, we're far too important to be controlled in any sort of way. We know exactly what we're doing. After he'd had some reports back from the front that actually things weren't quite as good with the Red Cross organisation as they could be, he had very stiff words with them about what ought to be done. He also had this knowledge of management techniques, which came through both the way that he'd operated in the Army Service Corps 
For example, back in 1905, he'd written the manual, which was still current for how the Army Service Corps should operate and the way in which it should be managed in large campaigns, which remained pretty much in place throughout the First World War. He had knowledge of scientific management methods from the United States, and he adapted those for the circumstances so that you had quite a sophisticated method of both collecting supplies and particularly in distributing them to the various theatres of war. At the same time, he was also doing lots of other things. He was still chairman of the RSPCA. He was the commandant of the Metropolitan Police Special Constabulary. He'd also founded the Camps Library, which distributed books and reading material to troops abroad. All in all, a very remarkable and forgotten personality. I've said that in the early part of the war, 1914-15, charity was dominated by large national organisations. This changed quite significantly during the war, and particularly after conscription came in. A lot of much smaller charities were formed, mainly to support the men from that particular parish, from that particular workplace, chapel or church, that went to war. They covered every aspect of society. So you had working class organisations, more middle class ones. You also had the whole of society becoming involved, including school children. Schools were brought into the campaign in lots of ways. They were knitting socks as well, but they were also doing things like collecting eggs and blackberries, which were being used for wounded soldiers. They even collected horse chestnuts, conkers, because you can manufacture acetone from them which can be used in explosives they didn't tell them what they were being used for in case it was thought to be wrong for children to be helping in the production of explosives though the experiment wasn't very successful you also had a number of extremely well-known child fundraisers probably the best known of the lot was a little girl called jenny jackson from burnley in lancashire she was the daughter of a miner From the age of six, she started collecting money for troop comforts in the town. Her mother made her a full military uniform so that she became known as Little Kitchener. Over the whole war, she collected something between two and three thousand pounds. That would probably be the equivalent of a hundred or two hundred thousand pounds today. And after the war in 1919, when we had the Great Peace March following the Treaty of Versailles, Jenny was the only child to be invited to officially take part in the ceremony and be present at the entombment of the unknown warrior. She lived on until she was in her 80s. Burnley seems to have been a hotbed of activity for young fundraisers because as well as Jenny Jackson, there was also Amy Foster, who became known as the Heeland Lassie because she dressed in a Highland outfit. I'm not sure how military it was. She too collected a lot of money in the Burnley area. Because Sir Edward Ward was particularly successful in balancing the relationship between charity and state, charity and philanthropy in the UK remained extremely strong throughout the war. In Germany, though they started out with at least a strong a charity and philanthropic sector, it significantly declined during the war, particularly after the Hindenburg-Ludendorff regime came in because they were trying to direct charity towards military ends. They were not balancing the requirements of the home front with the military front. What happened in charity and philanthropy mirrored a lot of what was happening in the rest of British society. We start off with a fairly haphazard, unregulated sector into which the state intervened more as the war went on, but managed to do so in a very British sort of way without alienating the activity that was already going on and keeping both morale and the strength of that sector as high as they possibly could. Looking to the period after the war, one of the interesting things that we see is that the relationship between charity and the state has changed. We're moving much more to a period where both the state considers charity more seriously and charity is more prepared to work hand in glove with the state. To illustrate that, in 1919, a national council 
of voluntary service was established on the lines of the local ones that had existed before the war. That was an example of how things were changing towards a more organised voluntary sector. The legacy in terms of the way in which Sir Edward Ward had organised things came through in a more business-like approach to charity. The National Council for Social Service issued pamphlets about how to organise charities, and it was the beginnings of what we would call the professionalised charity sector. It's a sector that we have been told very little about, but it's another very successful story from the First World War that continued into the post-war period. The other thing is the number of women that were involved. There were these middle-class women who were the sock knitters, but there were also hundreds and thousands of working-class women that became charity trustees and charity chairs, charity secretaries. The youngest one that I found was only 14 years old in Blackburn in Lancashire. It was giving working-class women responsibility for the first time in their lives, and this continued too into the post-war period. That was Dr Peter Grant on charitable work during the war. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorne and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from Dr Pierre Purseigle about how the home front coped with the influx of refugees.